You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Bed Rehabbers. Today I chat with Lowry Davies, a rehabilitation vet. She owns Smart Vets in Wales in the United Kingdom. She is one of our lecturers and she lectures on the Small Animal Platform and the Hydra Platform. So for those of you that are Small Animal members, I hope you caught last night's webinar by Jen Repack, Improving Canine Postures with Assisted Devices. It was really excellent. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you to Wiggle Less um, who sponsored that webinar. So Lowry and I chat about fibrocartilaginous embolisms, um, also known as FCEs. We chat about how we handle these clients, how we can support them. We chat about products, supplements, how we can rehabilitate these um, cases. And she also goes into some in-depth pathogenesis of the condition, um, which I found really, really interesting. Over to Lowry. Lowry, thank you so much for joining me. No problem. Good morning. Laurie is one of our seasoned online pet health lecturers. Um, and one thing I love about Laurie's lectures is that you always inspire me, Laurie, to think. Um, so afterwards, I had just all these things going on in my mind. Um, so I just want to let you know that you're really an inspiration to me. So I love listening to your lectures. Um, and thank you for, for everything that you do for us on online pet health. No problem. It's a pleasure. So, Larry, today we're going to be chatting about fibrocartilaginous embolisms. Can you tell the listeners about this condition, exactly what it is and what the pathogenesis of it is? Okay, so a fibrocartilaginous embolism is a neural injury, um, basically. Um, and it's an injury that I tend to associate with, rightly or wrongly, young and active dogs. Um, in essence, it's an ischemic injury. Um, the exact pathogenesis um, isn't really known. So there's a point of how sort of, well, sort of if we start at the start. Um, essentially, um, we think that a sort of a section of the nucleus pulposus breaks off in these non chondrodystrophic breeds of dogs um, and gains access into the spinal um, vascular network. Um, it usually lodges in the ventral spinal artery um and, and can do so at any point um in the spinal cord um but it tends to localize to the lumbosacral plexus um and maybe sort of slightly less commonly to the brachial sort of plexus also the c6 t2 outflow as well um but the point sort of what is really sort of a matter of debate i haven't been able to find a definitive answer in my research is um how sort of the sort of little sort of bit of disc material manages to embolize into the um vascular system so there isn't really a definitive answer as to how that happens once it has happened, um, we then sort of get an ischemic injury. That area sort of that is served by that um, sort of blood supply uh, is sort of essentially cut off. So we get an ischemic injury. And after that, then um, there isn't a huge difference in sort of um, pathology between that and a, in any contusion injury within the spinal cord. So. Um, the first thing that happens, step one in the problem is that we get this sort of occlusion of the blood supply. But what then happens um, is very much a biochemical and a metabolical um, problem. So it's, it's how sort of, sort of the energy delivery to the neuronal tissue. So um, both sort of the, the neuro tissue and the immune tissue that supports it within the central nervous system is affected. I find it so interesting and in preparing for this podcast, I actually did like a little PubMed search and um, I put in fibrocartilaginous embolism PubMed and forgot to put in dogs or animals and it actually came up with people. And I see this is actually something that happens in people and quite commonly in, in younger kids, like sort of teenagers, um, which I found really, really interesting. They're obviously mentioned in there, it is a condition mainly seen in, in dogs. Um, so these kind of cases, how would they classically present um, for the vet or for the vet rehab therapist? Um, 
I think it's sort of, you know, in the, it's, it's, they present per acutely. And I think the history is really important. So, you know, you'd be looking at signal moment. So a um, para sort of paritic or a paraplegic um, or a quadriplegic, quadriplegic individual. But with that sort of presenting per acutely, I think that's very, very important. Um, so if we compare that with our sort of chondrodystrophic sort of presentations of sort of disc sort of extrusions, um, what sort of often with those cases there's been a, a little bit of a more gradual decline in mobility or they may have sort of presented with pain beforehand but with um an fce typically it's the young labrador um that's running around or jumping for a ball and suddenly collapses to the floor so that will be my first sort of alarm bell um they are said to be non-painful now Clinically, I am not certain that that is true. They certainly don't sort of tend to present with screaming pain. They might scream in panic, but you don't get the pain intensity that you do sort of with a disc um, injury. But I do think that a lot of our cases are certainly slightly hyperesthetic to start with. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't sort of root, sort of categorically say that if they are showing pain, that it's not an FCE. Um, Signalment. So typically, I think there are some breed predispositions. So the miniature Schnauzer, even though it's mainly um, a problem of bigger dogs, German Shepherds and Irish Wolfhounds. Um, the other thing that you tend to see, though, again, maybe not so much. It, it per acutely but lateralization of signs so these dogs may go off sort of both back legs or sort of all four legs um but very quickly you get recovery um in sort of if it's if it's a paraparesis or paraplegia that one leg will seem to sort of regain function even in, in a matter of seconds sometimes within sort of an hour or so um but then you're left with an unilateral um Sort of a, a hemiparesis. Um, some of them do lose um, conscious pain or deep pain sensation. Um, and I think generally in terms of prognosis, those are the sort of the ones that you really don't want to see. Um, but I say just sort of typically a young dog um, that's very active, that collapses at exercise um, with a relatively rapid sort of partial recovery. I've also heard clients of mine say that they heard like an initial scream. So they just, and, and like you say, that could just be panic. I mean, suddenly your leg's not working, you know, the dog. Um, but they, there's initial scream and then no signs of, of, of pain. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that I've also experienced. Now, I mean, besides that pain, how would we or the vet differentiate a, a FCE from any other spinal lesion? Um, I think then it, you know, it comes down to sort of just basic sort of good clinical sort of examination skills and um, decision making. So um, I, you know, I think trying to neuroanatomically sort of locate the lesion um, and then um, plain radiographs um, are generally, you know, they're not going to show you anything. They're a waste of time. Um, even myelography, sometimes you can see a degree of um, cord edema in the very early stages. Um, but certainly definitive diagnosis, um, you'd need to proceed to MRI. And it's really by ruling out any sign of spinal cord compression. Um, so, you know, sort of it's, it's the lack of a compressive lesion um, that tells us that it is an FCE. Some severe cases will have changes within the CSF as well. You see sort of change in cell population within the CSF. And tell me, what is the prognosis? So let's say the dog has an MRI and it's confirmed it's a fibrocartilaginous embolism. What is the general prognosis in these cases? I would say variable. Um, there is sort of Res restoration of function in the upper motor neuron. So sort of say, say for example, they were tetraparetic or sort of paraparetic. Um, you will often sort of get reasonable restoration in, of function um, apart from in the most severely affected limbs. If, if for example, um, we have lower motor neuron signs in the thoracic or the pelvic limb, 
they can take a lot longer to improve. Probably, I would say in my experience, a lot sort of they, they have a worse prognosis for recovery than our disc associated um, spinal cord injuries. Um, they can, you know, if you're patient, we've got a, a Bernese mountain dog cross that we're treating at the moment um, that has um, gone from being sort of quadriparetic um, to having regained reasonable function um, through the right side, um, improving function in the left hind and very, very slow um, progression in the sort of in the left four, I was going to say near four, I've been doing too much horsework recently, in the left four. Um, and we're, what we're starting to see is um, a proximal to distal re-innovation happening. So, you know, we're starting to see sort of shoulder um, flexors and extensors sort of kicking back in. Um, and if you're trying to map sort of um, sensory sort of cutaneous sensation sort of with our pinpricks, we can see that we are getting a distal progression. But I think she's been with us now sort of since the end of November. Um, so you can imagine that that's a big commitment on the owner's part to nurse these dogs. And you also run into secondary complications, um, particularly with the forelimbs, not so much in the hind limbs, but of flexor tendon contractures if you're not careful. So you're, you're, you're then having to manage the secondary consequences of abnormal motion and loading. Obviously, as vet rehab therapists, we are crucial um, in the conservative treatment of these cases. Is there any surgical option in a fibrocartilaginous embolism? No, none at all. Um, and I think that is really important, you know, um, getting these dogs into rehab um, as quickly as possible is the only, you know, sort of form of treatment available um, it is not a surgical condition. I would sort of, um, you know, you might then at a later stage, I know some people consider amputation. So, you know, we're then, we're, we're then looking at a surgical option in terms of managing the consequences. Um, but that isn't certainly something that I would be embarking on in the first few months, um, at the very least. But no, in the acute stage, you know, this is not a case for spinal surgery. And obviously you're a more holistic practitioner. What is your feeling on using corticosteroids in these cases? Um, I'm, I'm not a great fan of corticosteroids. Um, you know, the, there is sort of papers out there that suggest using sort of corticosteroids in the first eight hours. Um, but I now sort of, I, I sort of from more the more recent human um, neurology meetings that I've attended, um, they, they are certainly out of favour. And, and the general consensus is that the, prognostically you're worse off. Um, and it is quite interesting um, because if we look at the pathogenesis, um, even though the primary injury is an ischemic injury, um, neuronal death, axon death, um, is very much a metabolic and a biochemical um, issue where we have a, a problem with energy delivery into the neurons and the immune cells of the spinal cord of the central nervous system. And what then happens is, um, it's sort of relatively complicated, but um, we get a lot of mitochondrial death. Um, we get inflammatory mediators released. We get cytokines released. Um, and it may be it's the population of cytokines that are released that are, um, are probably a better prognostic indicator because sort of how our individually um, how we manage these metabolic and biochemical changes within the central nervous system generally dictates the degree of cell death and apoptosis. Most of these changes happen within the first 24 hours, but they can go on for as long as six weeks. And what you start to see is quite a marked immune response. So these individuals will become lymphopenic um, and neutrophilic. Um, you see an increase in circulating ACTH as well. So potentially treating these cases with corticosteroids and further imbalance in the immune system is probably not the best approach. What we need to be doing supportively is to manage energy delivery and the inflammatory response, the free oxygen free radical release within the CNS. Are there any other supplements or, or medications that you recommend in, in the cases that you treat? 
Um, we put them on to high doses of antioxidants, Q10, to try and um, mop up any sort of free radicals that are around. Um, B vitamin complex, again, sort of is a useful um, sort of um, support in any neuronal injury, um, as well as sort of essential fatty acids. So th they would be our go to. Um, and then in terms of nutrition, it's a little bit controversial. Um, in terms, and it maybe you need to sort of uh, change your nutritional approach to, to, to mirror the progress of um, the disease as well. So in terms of maximizing mitochondrial function, um, a high level of fat in the diet would be desirable because um, fat metabolism promotes mitochondrial function. But maybe in the early stages, um, there is a case for actually reducing um, nutritional input and reducing the fat in the diet. Um, it's something that sort of I'm sort of looking into at the moment, um, again, to sort of reduce, sort of to try and minimize the amount of oxygen free radicals that are produced secondary to metabolism. Thank you. That's really interesting. So that um, antioxidant was coenzyme Q10. Q10. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's chat about the rehabilitation. Um, so obviously that's key to us. Um, generally, how long does it take to rehabilitate these cases? I mean, when an owner comes to you and they, their dog is being diagnosed, I mean, what, is, what do you normally say to them? Because it's one of these kind of things where you don't really have an answer. Do you give them a cutoff and say, we're going to do it for this amount of time? Or how, how do you approach these cases? Um, with honesty, I'm a neurologist um, last week. And I was saying that, you know, if, um, if a dog presents with, uh, you know, a mid shaft femoral fracture, you can compute sort of the age of the dog, the activity of the dog, um, the surgical technique, and you can be pretty accurate in, you know, your rehab sort of expectations, how long it's going to take, where you're going to be in, in two weeks, in four weeks, in six weeks. Um, if somebody says that about a neural case, then my, you know, if, if a sort of a client comes in and says, oh, you know, the neurologist said that um, this dog will be back walking in four weeks, then my answer would be, well, they're lying because no one knows. Um, and that's not surprising because again, you know, even though the primary injury is an ischemic injury, it is the degree of metabolic and biochemical changes, the amount, the number of neurons that die, the ongoing apoptosis and the immune response. So it's how our body deals with that, um, that I think actually determines progress. Um, and there are billions of um, neurons within our central nervous system. So what we see on an MRI scan, it might be the best MRI scan in the world, um, it's not going to really give us an indicator of progression and prognosis. Um, and also, sort of, you know, it's about remaking connections. So we can't image physiology, we can only image anatomy. Um, so how these neurons reconfigure, restructure themselves um, is anybody's guess. But it is also why rehab is so important. Um, so essentially, I would say, well, you know, it's a bit like you, you've got a house, you strip out the wiring and then you've got to rewire it and you hope that you make a sensible connection so that when you press the light switch in the kitchen, the light comes on in the kitchen and not in the bathroom upstairs. So um, I personally, as a rehab, as the person in charge of the rehab program, will have a role to play in how well these individuals do. The owners will have a role to play. And why, as a rule of thumb, the smaller dogs do better because just physically they're easier to work with. You know, we can lift them up, we can move them around. Um, the owners have to be engaged with the exercise and the patient has to be engaged. So if the patient is happy to be carried around and there is no drive to get back on their feet, then those patients will often do worse and they might be the ones that present to present with sort of conscious pain. They might do worse in the long term than the ones that present without conscious pain, but are determined to get back on their feet. Um, so it's how, it's how we can manipulate um, the sort of reformation of synaptic connections and branching within the central nervous system um, in the region of injury that is really important. 
Yeah, it's so tricky, you know, because these clients come to you obviously wanting answers that we can't give. But um, one thing we can do is celebrate the wins, even the small ones. Um, so when we start to see those connections happening and we start to see the improvement, um, let them know and let them share in it. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, so if we run through just looking at these cases, um, so like a brief summary, which I know is you could go into a lot of detail, but a brief summary, you know, when the case presents, how you would rehabilitate it from sort of start to finish. Um, well, I think the first thing to say is that you need to be pretty aggressive. So you start as soon as possible. So, you know, if they went off their feet this morning, I would be pretty much if they were comfortable, be trying to sort of get on top of things or get the antioxidants on board, get the supplements into the system as soon as possible. Um, the other thing probably is as well to look at the diet to make sure it's not a pro inflammatory diet. So, you know, I tend to go for sort of organic, you know, really good quality quality basic diet as well. I would then be looking to do sort of supported standing um, again as soon as they were comfortable um, maybe sort of you know depending upon the size getting them over a ball um, I tend not to use sort of hoists if at all possible even with the bigger dogs I prefer to sort of just supporting them over a ball I think it's a more normal sort of position for them to be in um, passive range of motion exercises sensory stimulation and also thinking about how we are going to manage their environment at home so do any changes need to be made in terms of flooring um, don't isolate these um, animals they need to be in clinic we try and have them up in the treatment room um, so again you know there is a really strong link between sort of mental um, focus and your sort of mental disposition so if these dogs start to get depressed for example they generally don't tend to do well neurologically so you know you want to keep them engaged and you want to push them relatively hard so you're going to be doing these exercises you know five six times a day um and in order to try and maximize recovery but again you know that becomes you know it's much easier to do it with a miniature schnauzer than it is with an irish wolfhound um but sort of conforming bedding non-slip surfaces all of those kinds of things in terms of nursing and then we would get them on a treadmill and start to sort of initiate walking um, again, probably from about 48 to 72 hours in the quicker that we can get hold of them, the better. Um, and then ideally, you want to do a minimum of two walking sessions a week so that you do get um, acquisition and memory. So oh, probably just one walking session a week is not going to make enough of a difference to that individual so that you don't get any carryover so what the nervous system learns in that period um doesn't carry over to the next session um and that is mirrored by bdnf profiles the brain derived neurotrophic factor it is increased by activity and it's a really important um growth factor in promoting neuronal sprouting within the central nervous system and what um, the studies have shown is that after a period of activity BDNF values stay high for about 48 72 hours so if you can then to sort of reinstigate further activity at that point you keep the BDNF profiles high so I think it is really important to aim for a minimum of two walking sessions a week equally importantly is not to let these animals teach themselves um, bad habits so making bad synaptic connections um, so if we you know we, we've got to two things we've got to achieve is that we've got to sort of get these dogs walking on land so anything that we teach the nervous system and so sort of we're exploiting this phenomenon which is called plasticity so injury to the cns makes the cns susceptible to making new connections um, the sort of the juvenile has got a lot more redundancy so there are empty synapses in, in young animals that we can exploit the older we get the fewer of these empty synapses that, that are there so it's generally the older the individual the more difficult it is to sort of regenerate a correct walking pattern but if what the sort of sort of if what the sort of plasticity sort of allows us to do is to pull ourselves around by the front legs and the brain sort of to spinal cord to peripheral receptors if it then 
that becomes imprinted in the CNS very simply. It may well be that that is the walking pattern that's established. Um, so it's really important to cage rest these individuals, not so much to prevent further damage, but to prevent wrong connections being made. They don't need to learn to do things badly, which is why I'm a big fan of teaching them to walk on the treadmill. Um, but also you've got to remember that there, that there has to be a transfer of skill. So it's no good having these dogs that can walk in the treadmill or cats. Very occasionally do cats do get FCs as well um, if that doesn't carry over onto land. When you say treadmill, are you talking about an underwater treadmill? Yeah, but we, I mean, ideally an underwater treadmill, we do a lot of work on the land treadmill as well. And I'm really keen to point this out because obviously um, the difference in price between a water treadmill and underwater treadmill and a land treadmill is quite significant. And you can get really, really far in rehab with a land treadmill, provided you've got a little bit of imagination. So you obviously with these, this is where a hoist would come in handy. So you've got to be able to find another means of support that isn't just the buoyancy of the water. Now, there are other benefits from the water, obviously, in terms of um, sensory input, proprioceptive input. But just to reestablish a walking pattern, then a land treadmill can be a really valuable tool provided you've got the dog supported. So the important thing is that you are moving um, the limbs in the correct sequence and that you are making sure that movement is being derived from each individual limb. So if you watch these dogs sometimes, um, you start to see that sort of the front limbs, the central pattern generators in the front limbs are completely dictating hind limb motion. And if you put the front limbs on a plate, then you don't get anything in the back legs at all. So I do think um, you do have, you tend to need a degree of four limb dominance in central pattern generator activity, but it is really important to move the back legs individually as well and making sure that there is a degree of initiation from the hind legs. Otherwise, all you're ending up with is a spinal walking pattern. Yeah, so you'd essentially have them hoisted and then you're kneeling down there walking with their back legs. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And we also have Daxi walkways. So we have um, planks around the building at sort of waist height that we can then walk the Daxis on as well, which makes life a lot easier. Um, but, um, you know, you again, a little bit of invention takes you a long way. Are there any other products that you recommend to assist you in rehabilitating these cases? Oh, I, I you know, I, th I think it is imagination. So I like sort of tactile surfaces. I think that is really important that we get the peripheral afferent input through the feet on the ground. So using, you know, we have a, a wide array of carpets, mats, rubber, you know, any kind of tactile surface. Um, the peanut balls and the gym balls, again, for support, um, that can get you a long way. So putting them under the belly to help you. Um, we have some let's say, elevated walkways are absolutely brilliant for the smaller dogs so that they can be up and you can be walking them along. Um, and I think probably... Is that just a, like a shelf on, on yep. your walk, basically? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, non yeah, yeah non-slip surface i mean we we use our we've got an agility seesaw um which is non-slip so we just repurpose that you know it's on trestles um it's stable um i use a lot of trampettes as well so um the little you know sort of the little trampettes where i'll put the dog between my legs um and sort of just shift my weight and then that's really good for developing whole body whole body balance um We've got a vibration plate um, I'm playing around with. I'm not convinced that that is that helpful, but I haven't used, you know, it's quite, again, it's quite, it can be quite an expense. Um, so in terms of value for money, if I was going to invest in one piece of equipment um, and I didn't have the money for a water treadmill, it certainly would be a land treadmill. Right. Um, what about wheelchairs? Um, so, I mean, you know, obviously at end stage, when we get to a stage where we're not able to get full function back in these cases, that is an option that we give owners. How do you feel about using wheelchairs in the early stages of rehabilitation? 
I'm not a fan of them in the early stages because, again, it comes back to your neuronal plasticity and how you exploit it. So if they start to sort of get used to moving around and they establish the movement happens without the use of the hind legs, then um, I tend to find that those dogs do not progress very well. So for me, um, rightly or wrongly, it is... Um, a tool for improving quality of life. It's a tool when we have failed to make progress. And with all of the spinal cases that we've dealt with, there hasn't been one um, that has progressed from wheelchair to walking. Um, you know, uh, it, it is, you know, we have some that can walk a little bit, but in order to prolong their walk and get them a bit of better quality of life, that they will, they'll do a little bit in the wheelchair and then they will go and, um, you know, then they'll sort of finish the walk in the wheelchair. But generally those are the degenerative cases. So the ones that have had, that have had a gradual loss of ability rather than the ones that become acutely um, para or tetraparetic, and then you're trying to reestablish movement. I must say for myself, the times that I've used wheelchairs have been in those those dogs that get severely depressed about yeah. not being able to walk. And then there's that balance, you know. Um, but then you do get those ones that um, get very lazy. So as soon, like you say, as soon as they realize they can move um, without trying to do anything. Um, so there is that balance between those. Um, if we look at the challenges that the owners face, um, what are their biggest challenges? And I think the most important thing is how can we support them? Yeah, I, I think, you know, they need an awful lot of psychological and emotional support. And going back to my earlier point, the size of the dog is generally going to dictate um, how well these dogs do, because, you know, if you are living on your own and your pet is a, a Bernese cross collie, um, standing at about 40 kilos, that is going to be very, very difficult to manage. And I think the most important thing is to say to the owners that there is no right or wrong decision in these cases. You know, it has to be what's right for you and what is right for your pet. Um, and I think our role is to be supportive and not to criticise. I think that is really, really important. And it's why, our, you know, it's sort of financial considerations come into it. And I will often say to an owner, look, there is no point in you coming to see me to treadmill once a week. That is a waste of your money. You're better off doing the exercises at home. Um, uh, maybe come to see me once a week in order for us to, you know, make sure that the animal's pain management is OK, that we're not getting flexor tendon contractures for us to do some soft tissue work or to give you more exercises. But there is no benefit in terms of an outlay for one treadmill session a week. I think, you know, you need to do two um, for you to get the maximum sort of uh, benefit out of it. Um, Lifestyle is really important, you know, it is uh, in terms of if you are working, you know, long hours every day, then who's going to be looking after that dog, you know, in the eight hours or the 10 hours that you're away from home. So all of these are really important considerations. Um, and some and, you know, what is right for one dog is not right for another. I think you have to be honest with them from the start. And I think this is um, maybe not so much with the FCE cases, um, but I think it is important to touch on in terms of spinal rehab, that a lot of people think that um, the dog is gonna be cured by surgery. So that they take these um, non-ambulatory pets into the veterinary um, surgery and you know everybody goes through sort of, you know, what's gonna happen and how they won't get better without surgery. But, they then expect to be given a mobile dog back. And I don't think, I think there is, as a profession, we're not, we don't spend enough time counseling the owners. And so quite often, you know, then in the, in the rehab consult, when we meet them for the first time, we have to um, lower their expectations. Um, you know, we have to tell them this is the long haul. Your dog is not going to be up and walking or some of them are, but very few of them get back up on their feet very quickly. This is usually a, you know, a 12 week minimum of a 12 week rehab period. Hopefully by the end of four weeks, we have got mobility um, and continence, but that isn't always the case. Um, so I think honesty is really important from the start. So make sure that the person knows what they're letting themselves in for 
make sure that they're committed to the process um, and that it's going to work for them. And if it's not going to work for them, then don't make them feel guilty. You know, I, I think I often ask myself, you know, if I had a different job and my dog was, you know, um, requiring sort of rehab from a spinal injury, how would I be able to commit to that? Um, I think that's a really important question. Yeah, I think every client has different circumstances, but I like that. So don't judge them, um, don't criticize them, just support them in whatever the choices that they make. So you mentioned that 12 weeks, is is that your cutoff? Like, do you say to them, we're going to give it 12 weeks? I mean, wh when do you make that decision to them to say, right, we're going into a wheelchair now? This is These are your options. Yeah, I think 12 weeks, um, it is... It's an arbitrary, you know, how long is a piece of string? The thing, for me, certain things have to happen. So there has to be progression. Um, and I think that is where understanding the difference between motor learning and a temporary alteration of performance is really important. So, if, you know, we might keep these dogs for the day or we might keep them for the week. Um, and if you see an improvement on Monday over the course of Monday, and then you get the dog back on Thursday and you're back to where you were on, on Monday morning. That is just a improvement in performance. But if you start off on Thursday morning where you finished on Monday, then that is motor learning. So the dog, the central nervous system has learned, it has retained and hopefully it has progressed. And I think that is really important distinction to make, because if you're not getting that distinction, if all you're getting is just a temporary improvement that it doesn't have a carryover, you can often be fooled into thinking the dog is doing better than it actually is. So you really need to tell, not kid yourself. You know, you need to be looking for ongoing constant progression. The quicker that progression happens, obviously, the better it is for the dog. Um, but if they're not, you know, if you, you and again, this is where, you know, sort of revisiting, looking at your sort of um, objectively as a, or as objectively as you can um, at your improve, performance improvement, whether that is them being able to step independently one or two steps, moving to five steps, how long can they stand independently in, you know, um, continence sort of coming back, all of these little things that you're looking for every time you see the dog to see if there has been an improvement. And if the answer is no, then maybe you need to bring things to an end quicker. Um, and again, this is where, you know, I would also then factor in finances and lifestyle, because maybe for some people they'll say, you know, we we did have we did have a very sad case um, that was an FCE. Um, rehab was delayed because their advice um, from another source was to delay the rehab. By the time that we got the dog, um, he was pretty much handstanding. He was just dragging his back end around. And we made huge improvements in the first week, but then we didn't make any further improvement after that. And this was a young active dog that was used to going out running with the owner. And, you know, at four weeks, we were like, well, this isn't going anywhere. You know, we, we made a huge improvement, but it wasn't, you know, it was probably in sort of just pain management, sort of soft tissue, connective tissue. We didn't really impact on the neuronal system. Um, and we made the decision at that point because we didn't think that we were going to gain, you know. So um, I think 12 weeks is a good sort of frame time, you know, for improvement and getting so that maybe you only see them occasionally and, you know, that everything is going fine. But I really do think you have to take it on a day by day basis. Yeah, that's great advice. In in the, all the years that you've been consulting, have you ever seen a reoccurrence? Have you had a, a, a patient that has had two fibrocartilaginous embolisms? Uh, yes, I have had a reoccurrence. Um, but I am not sure because... We, we, we had a patient that was diagnosed with a fibrocartilaginous embolism. Um, but I have a suspicion that maybe it was an ischemic bleed rather than a definitive FCE. So it was an ischemic lesion and that recurred. Um, 
I, that is the only we've definitely had one and again you know prognostically sort of the dog didn't do any worse after the second one than it had after the first one you know it, it carried on and I lost contact with them about five years down the line um that was early on in my career um and I do wonder there are certain things that I am a little bit uncomfortable with some of the um sort of worming vaccinating anything that challenges the immune system I am a little bit concerned with in terms of um deteriorating clinical signs lungworm is the other one um that you know I think now people are much much more aware of lungworm but um maybe 10-15 years ago um the awareness wasn't there when it was sort of increasing in the in the sort of in the population and possibly sort of yeah, again sort of bleeds sort of spinal bleeds a secondary to that may have been an issue yeah I mean I think it's an interesting thing because it's it's one of those conversations that sometimes come up with owners you know if they're about to go ahead and go ahead with 12 weeks of rehabilitation is this something that's going to happen again is it unlikely um I must say I've never seen to uh, one case that's had um, two FCEs and um, maybe someone else has. So if you, if you have, please let us know. We'd love to know about it. Um, Larry, there was a question in one of our Facebook groups from Amy Hesback. Um, so we, we, we put a post in there to say we were going to have this podcast and um, she had a really interesting question. So she said she's had a few clients who've experienced waxing and waning functions in their dogs. And this is like one year post FCE. Um, she said she's spoken to neurologists. There's been no obvious explanation for this. She hasn't, the, the animals haven't had an infection. They haven't been overworked or fatigued. There's been no change at all. Just a short term decline in function for about a week or two. Any ideas? And is this something that you've experienced too? Um, you do. We see them occasionally. Um, my gut instinct is that it probably is a change within the metabolism of, um, again, sort of, you know, the neuron, the axon, the, the immune cell, potentially probably more within the immune cell. So has it been some sort of immune challenge that has changed metabolism within our surviving neuronal circuitry? Um, and the, you know, after the original injury, um, there, there is again less redundancy in the system, so it's going to be much more sensitive to sort of changes in metabolism, changes in energy delivery. Um, so, you know, sometimes food manufacturers change um, the, you know, they have a a sort of a protein, fat, and carb um, quota that they have to fulfil, but they might well change the raw materials. So even though the food hasn't changed, maybe something has changed. Um, maybe something that they've encountered in the environment. Um, yes. All of those things can, um, I think, affect, you know, affect the CNS. It's quite sensitive. Um, so I don't think it has to be something that is, as obvious as you know falling off a wall or it, it's often it's not an in injury it is a metabolic physiological um issue worming um flea treatments vaccinations again i don't don't get me wrong i'm not an anti-vaxxer but i really do think that um in some cases the same with some you know sort of human neurological conditions then you have to be extremely careful not to expose the body to an immune challenge um so that would be you know sort of having made sure that there wasn't any sort of compensatory lameness issues um that they weren't you know just getting really tight to the muscles of the back assuming that everything like that has been ruled out then that is probably where i would look to um and i do quite like to you know check my hematology routinely um keep them on antioxidants long term, um, minimize the challenge to the immune system long term with these neural cases, I think is really important to do. Thanks for your opinion on that, Larry. And Amy, thanks for the question. Larry, it's been really, really interesting. I have learned loads. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge on this condition. Um, and we look forward to some more lectures from you um, in the year of 2021. Pleasure. Thank you for asking me. Have a great day. Bye-bye. And you. Bye. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review and know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continued education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.